On this day of discovery, author and Cornerstone University President Joe Stoll enters a land rich in biblical history, modern Turkey, to explore the ancient city of Pergamum. Here in Pergamum, a group of Jesus followers came together as a church, one of seven churches addressed in the beginning of the book of Revelation. Revelation, written by the Apostle John, once the young disciple of Jesus Christ. At the end of the first century, Christianity is facing mounting opposition in the empire. John is a prisoner on the island of Patmos for his faith in one God, which goes against a Roman Empire that embraces many gods, chief among them the Caesar of Rome. It is on Patmos that Jesus appears to John to send a message to the world, a message that is today what we know as the Book of Revelation. But to the first century church, letters of challenge and hope. Journey to the seven churches of Revelation, the letter to Pergamum, on this day of discovery. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name, written which no one knows except him who receives it. A trip to Pergamum today is quite an experience. It is among the best excavated cities of the Roman world. Some of its stunning sites include the Hellenistic Theater, with a capacity of 10,000 for its attendees. It was the steepest of all the theaters in the ancient world. Pergamum was filled with many temples to the gods of Rome and Greece. And of note, this is the location of the Library of Pergamum, which held some 200,000 volumes. Long before the birth of Jesus Christ, Pergamum was the capital city of the Pergamum Empire, that empire that held this region of the world in its grip. But by the year 200 BC, King Attalus reigned here. One of the things that Attalus did was strike a peace treaty with Rome. As a part of that treaty, Rome gave him control over almost all of Asia Minor. Uh, this territory, now called Turkey, where these seven churches were born. But in a fascinating move, his grandson, Attalus III, upon his death bequeathed all of this territory back to the Roman Empire. Now that was a great day for the Roman Empire because this was a very critical piece of land. Uh, Turkey borders on three major bodies of water, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, and the Aegean Sea. That opened all the seaports of commerce to the Roman Empire. All the sea lanes belonged to them. And this was agriculturally rich. It was the breadbasket of their day. Uh, it was so good that in AD 92, the emperor Domitian made an edict that all the vineyards in Asia Minor should be cut down because the competition against the Italian vineyards was so great. So it was a good day for the empire. But it was a better day for the gospel because behind the scenes of these political maneuverings, the hands of God were at work. Some of you may remember that before he was 30 years old, Alexander the Great conquered all the known world. 
which gave the known world one culture, the Greek culture, gave the known world one language, the Greek language. That miracle was something that prepared the way of the gospel through all of the Roman Empire. After Alexander's death, though, it split up into smaller pieces, and by now, Rome had everything back for its empire except this bridge of land between the east, Jerusalem, and the west, Italy, and Spain, and all of Europe. When Attalus handed it back to the Roman Empire, that meant that there would be no barriers to the gospel, that everything would be wide open in the empire. And so Christianity spread. I love watching the hand of God at work preparing the way for the gospel. And early Christians lived here in the city of Pergamum, and they held the good news of Jesus Christ in their hand. They held it at great cost, because in Pergamum, it was at great risk. When it came to worshiping the gods of the empire, Pergamum was exactly the right place to be. Nearly every major deity had a temple here. It would be like going to Hollywood. <laughs> and in Hollywood, you can take a star tour. They put you in a little van and you drive through these exclusive neighborhoods and see where all the important re people really live. Coming to Pergamum, in terms of worship, it's exactly like that. Um, no matter what you desired or what you needed or what you dreamt for, the gods would offer here to fulfill that for you. Pergamum was exactly the right zip code to be in. The array of gods and goddesses in this town was impressive. Uh, right over this hill here, still existing, is the ancient altar to Zeus. Zeus was the king of Mount Olympus, where all the gods and goddesses dwelt. Uh, so he was the king of kings. Uh, Zeus was the god of the sky, of lightning and thunder, and would use lightning against his enemies. It's said that he consorted with mortals and gods and goddesses. Well, if you needed something done, <laughs> that was the place to go. He had all the power. But maybe you came to Pergamum for pleasure. Then why not go to the temple of Dionysus? Uh, he was the god of wine and revelry. You would go there and participate in the festivities, get drunk with everyone else, participate in the orgies. Sometimes the frenzy was so, so strong that it would end up in the taking of human life. Going to that temple was like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, <laughs> or going to New Orleans for the Mardi Gras. But if you're in need of food, need of a good crop, then you want to go to the temple of the goddess of Demeter. Uh, she was the one who could guarantee you food on your table and a wonderful crop at the end of the season. Maybe you're sick. Then here in Pergamum was the temple to Asclepius, the god of healing. It was one of the major spots for healing in the world. Pilgrims came from all over to come to this temple. And in this temple, it was the snakes that did the healing. Um, the priests of the temple would often put people in a trance. They would go to sleep, and, and then they would get a vision of what was wrong with them, and they could take it to the doctor and tell the doctor, and he would try to somehow medicate it. Uh, in an even stranger ritual, they would often put the sick people in a large room at night that's pitch black. And in the middle of the night, in their deep trance-like sleep that had been induced on them, they would release the snakes to crawl over their bodies in a ritual of healing. Interestingly, even today, the medical symbol that we see is a rod with snakes wound around it. It dates right back to that hospital here in Pergamum. Or maybe you need wisdom. You just don't know what to do then come to the temple of Athena, the goddess of wisdom, the goddess who would understand and form great military strategies for Rome to win its wars. 
Or, if you wanted to affirm that Caesar was Lord of Lords, the Savior of your life, granting you safety and peace, then you would come to the temple of the imperial cult up on the top of the mountain, the temple to Trajan. This was the scene at Pergamum. And if you were a follower of Jesus Christ and you refused to bow the knee, it was a good thing for you to hear what Jesus said at the beginning of the letter when he said, I know the place where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. To understand how challenging it would be to be a follower of Jesus Christ here in Pergamum, let's say that you and I are Jews who live here. And you and I decide to go back to Jerusalem with pilgrims from all over the world to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. So we pack up and we go and go through the rituals of the feast. But while we're there, something really strange happens. Because we see a group of men who are making amazing claims. Uh, they claim that Jesus has come, the Messiah. That he is the king of the Jews. And the miracles surrounding that catch our attention. And we're drawn by the Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ. And you and I accept Christ as our Savior there, and we're baptized. <laughs> oh, what an amazing experience for us. And now we're packed up on our way back here to Pergamum. And we're rejoicing in having found him. We're rejoicing that we have found the King of Kings. Uh, that we now have dwelling within us this Jesus, who promises us ultimate pleasure. Like he said, that he has come to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. And we heard how he fed the 5,000, that he is the feeder and provider. We were told while we were there that he did miracles of healing. In fact, we saw some of his followers, apostles, healing people. We had, we had met the ultimate healer. And wisdom? Well, the apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and Savior, Emperor. He has saved us from our sins and granted us eternal life. And we're going back rejoicing about that until we think about actually walking through the city gates. And now we know there's trouble ahead. It's trouble ahead because going back and telling our Jewish friends this will probably get us kicked out of the synagogue. And if we make these claims of Jesus Christ, that he is king of kings, not Zeus, that he is the source of ultimate and true pleasure, uh, that he is the provider, not Demeter, that Athena is not the source of wisdom. Wisdom is found in Jesus Christ. Well, then it just all flies in the face of the gods. And we will be God deniers. We will be thought of as the charge was thrown at early Christians, that they are atheists, that they do not believe in the gods. And we'll be out of the synagogue and we'll be out of the temple worship, caught in no man's land, where Satan's throne is. That was the challenge to these early Christians. So being a follower of Christ in Pergamum was really a high-risk adventure. It threatened your comfort, your personal peace, relationships with valued family members and friends. It threatened your prosperity, could even threaten your position in the community. Uh, there was no part of your life that was not touched by your stand for Jesus Christ in the midst of all of these gods and goddesses. In fact, your very life was at risk. In the letter, Jesus has recognized that Antipas has already been martyred for the faith. In Pergamum, the Roman governor of this region had his head offices. Uh, it is said that he had the right to the sword. In other words, every case brought before him, he could say, they will live or they will die by the sword. Antipas probably died 
by the sword of the Roman governor. Interestingly, as he proceeded through the streets, before him was somebody who held a giant sword in the air. Talk about intimidation. Christians knew that on a sword like that, the blood of Antipas was spilled. So Jesus commends these early Christians that even in the face of Antipas's death, they have held fast to the name of Jesus. I love that. You know, like, hold on. Did you ever get into a dangerous spot and somebody says, hey, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Jesus said, you've held fast to my name. Now, obviously, it wasn't just the name Jesus, although that did mean Savior and Rescuer. But in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, the names of God reflect His character. So, uh, the name that He is King of Kings, the name that He is the source of abundant life, the name that He is Healer, the source of wisdom, uh, the name that He is the provider for all of our needs, they have held on to who Jesus really is. There is a hymn that early Christians sang, probably here in Pergamum. It's recorded in Philippians chapter 2. And the hymn words go like this, that God has highly exalted Jesus Christ and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess to the glory of the Father. Christians believed that. They would not let go of his name. And Jesus said, and even in spite of Antipas's martyrdom, you have held fast to the faith. They have been tenacious. They have not been shaken. But that wasn't true of everybody here. There were some people in Pergamum in the church who were tired of being different, who were tired of being excluded, who didn't like the danger of following Christ. Oh, they wanted to be a part of the assembly but they wondered if there could be a way to compromise and to release the pressure. Well, interestingly enough, there was. So, if you don't like being different, <laughs> and you don't like the danger, and you don't want to be excluded, maybe what you could do would be kind of sneak back into the temple worship and still be a Christian. Jesus says, you can't do that. In fact, he says that I know that there are some of you who are practicing sexual immorality and eating meat offered to idols. Now, as bad as sexual immorality is on its own, this is far worse because he's saying that they're going back in and doing sexually immoral things as an act of worship to the deities. That's what happened in these temples. You slept with prostitutes. It was an act of allegiance and worship. And eating meat offered to idols, well, Paul tells us that if you just buy it in the marketplace, it's probably not a problem. But if you do it in the temple, it's all a part of worshiping these gods and goddesses. So in effect, these believers, trying to escape the pressure, have denied the name of Christ and cut an allegiance with these gods of wood and stone. Jesus takes that seriously. He compares it to the Jews who gave in to Baal. Numbers chapter 25, the Israelites married Moabite women and began worshiping the gods of the Moabite women, the gods of Baal, and God judged them. And 24,000 Israelites were murdered as a judgment by God on this assimilation of faithfulness to God and compromise with idolatry. Assimilation into the systems of our world to try to release us from the stress and pressure has always been a problem. It certainly was a problem for Israel when they tried to relieve the pressure by consorting with the gods of the Canaanites. And Jesus tells us it's a problem here in Pergamum when Christians try to live in both worlds at once. The problem in the church of Pergamum was not that the church was in Pergamum. <laughs> It was there was too much Pergamum in the church. And I found myself thinking, what are the things that marginalize us today that we try to reduce and discount so that we can stay in the mainstream? And immediately, the whole concept of sin came to my mind. 
Why is it that we hear so little proclamation about the danger of sin and call to repentance? You can go to churches today that are like a psychological pep rally. <laughs> you feel really good about yourself when you leave. Repentance is a non-issue. Now, hell doesn't go down real well with our culture. It's kind of embarrassing that God would send people to hell. So we don't hear much about that anymore. Or maybe we, you know, try to talk it away and make it not be as bad as the judgment of God says it's going to be. Or that Jesus is the only way. I, I hear Christians saying, well, he's the only way for me. You know, I can't say that for everybody else, but he is the only way for me. It seems to me we're fudging a little bit there. Or even suffering. That Jesus Christ has told us to take up our cross and follow him and that suffering is part and parcel of our walk with him and his work in our life. And you go to, go to churches today that will tell you that's not true, that Jesus wants you to be healthy and happy and wealthy and if you just trust him enough, he'll give you everything you want. Well, if Jesus was upset about this stuff at Pergamum, I wonder what he thinks about us today who lose our edge, our distinctiveness, our dynamic difference in the power of the gospel by trying to compromise around the edges. Well, if he called them to repent, he must call us to repent as well. So the believers in Pergamum were stuck in a really bad place where it was tough to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And most of them prevailed. They held fast. They would not let go. I can't help but think of some of us who find ourselves stuck in a bad place where it's tough to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've accepted Christ as your Savior and you walk back into your home into a relationship with your spouse who doesn't share your faith. That's tough. At the office, to prevail as an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ among colleagues who speak behind your back, think you're weird for what you believe, think you're arrogant and bigoted to believe that Jesus is the only way. Or maybe you're stuck in loneliness because you won't play the sex games of dating and the parties after the office. I don't know, but I just know that when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you get stuck in bad places where it's tough to hang on and to not let go. So to these followers at Pergamum, Jesus had a great closing statement in the letter, a statement of reward. He said, for those of you who overcome, I will give you manna from heaven, a reference to the Old Testament feeding of the Israelites when they otherwise would have starved to death. God provided for them. Think of the manna, manna of, of his love and companionship, the manna of his wisdom, the manna of his word, the manna of prayer, of the indwelling Holy Spirit, how he provides for you. Cling to those things because he says, I will provide. But then I love what he says next. For those who prevail, you will receive a white stone with a name on it that no one else has and no one else knows. So what does that mean? Well, we're not really sure. But in the ancient world, invitations to major festivities and events by the emperor um, were done on a white piece of marble and your name would be engraved as an invitation to come. And when you entered the festivities, you would present your invitation on this white piece of marble that had your name on it. So think of these believers who were excluded from the festivities, who had no welcome in the society or in the culture, hearing that ultimately Jesus will invite them to his feast. Their name will be on there, actually a name that no one else knows. It's like your pin number. This is so intimate. And you will be welcomed into the festivities and pleasure of his presence. Now, in my mind, that's worth hanging on for. That's what Jesus promises to those who are faithful. 
great will be their reward in heaven. Thank you.